ओके ओके सर वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल टुडे वी हैव विद अस प्रोफेसर थॉमस सुमन ही इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ जियोलॉजिकल इंजीनियरिंग डिपार्टमेंट डायरेक्टर ऑफ द कंप्यूटेशनल साइंस एंड इंजीनियरिंग uh phd program at michigan technological university he is actively involved in undergraduate and graduate education research and survey he teaches the engineering geology course at michigan tech has participated in over 7 million in research grant and published over 80 peer reviewed journal articles his research focuses on utilizing remotely sensed data machine learning algorithms and geological knowledge to solve real world problems that affect human health and safety beyond michigan tech he serves as the editorial board member of the gsa and aeg joint publication environmental and engineering geosciences vice chair of the ac geo institute engineering geology and site characterization committee a member of aeg technical committee on landslides and a member of agu national natural hazards awards committee he is also an abet program evaluator for the geological engineering and geology programs today he will be delivering a technical talk on new paradigm in geotechnical performance monitoring using remote sensing so in the chat box we will post uh, his website university website details participants who are interested in further discussions can contact him through his official email id uh, professor roman uh, i welcome yes. you uh, to this uh, talk okay now over yes. to you sir thank you well uh, thank you professor rajiv kumar for this uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate in this uh, event and i hope you are all able to hear me well um so yeah. my talk today as uh, professor rajiv kumar mentioned is on the new paradigm in geotechnical performance monitoring using remote sensing let me begin with uh, why geotechnical uh, performance monitoring is important in recent years um there has been a lot of um, interest in geotechnical performance monitoring related topics in us um here are some of the um the recent publications from the asc and the transportation research board Uh, the where they have highlighted the need for geotechnical performance monitoring um one you can see here um the the field of geotechnical asset management is a growing field where geotechnical performance monitoring is critical uh where uh the the question is can we build and forget or do we need to manage for the future uh the infrastructure that we build and if we need to manage do we need to do performance monitoring to be able to manage um you can see another one uh, of the issues highlighting the performance monitoring of geotechnical structures um the transportation research news highlighting that the performance management in practice so there are there has been a lot of interest in geotechnical performance monitoring in recent years in the us and let i would actually begin by showing you what is the significance of this performance monitoring how is it done currently and how can we do it differently with remote sensing so th those would be i would actually show you some case studies where i can uh hopefully convince you that there is ways we can do it differently using remote sensing so 
to begin with the significance of performance monitoring um, here let me i have three um, figures here and let me explain to you first one that i want to explain to you is the figure on the right um, top corner uh, the lines here represent the US uh, road network, the primary and the secondary road network. And the red shadings represent the areas that have high susceptibility for landslides. And you can see here that there is a large portion of US road network that is vulnerable to landslide hazards or ground movements. This is true in other infrastructures all, also when we look at. So here on the left top corner, you can actually see uh, all the levees in US. Um, the counties with levees are shaded in brown. And you can see that a lot of levees also fall in landslide prone regions and are vulnerable. Um, on the bottom right bottom corner, I have the the points representing the 8,100 major dams in the United States. And if you take that and overlay with the landslide um, high susceptibility zones, you can again see that many of those dams are also falling in these high susceptible zones where um, they are vulnerable to landslides and ground movements. So when you consider all this critical infrastructure and the vulnerabilities that we have and the aging infrastructure, particularly in US, there are many of these infrastructure are quite old and the uncertainty that we have over climate change and increased extreme rainfall events, which I, I'm sure um, you all are quite familiar because Kerala is experiencing some of that uh, in the past couple of years uh, with uh, high intensity rain in a very short duration. So when you consider all of this, to build and forget is not an option. We need to actually monitor and manage our infrastructure. The build and forget policy was of the past, and we need a more proactive uh, monitoring and management of the infrastructure. Now, we monitor um, sites, um, we do geotechnical monitoring, and we utilize that information to characterize site conditions prior to the design we utilize that for uh, construction activities, performance infrastructure, uh, to compare our design assumptions uh, to the actual loading. So we use this geotechnical performance monitoring for various purpose, both uh, during for informational purposes or for taking actions during emergencies. Now, how is it traditionally done? Uh, traditionally, we have uh, instruments that have been developed um, that are uh, placed in ground for in-situ measurements. Uh, when it comes to lateral deformation, we have uh, inclinometers, uh, extensiometers, uh, tilt meters. I'm sure the, uh, most of you are familiar with this and have used some of these uh, instruments. Uh, when it comes to vertical deformation, we have settlement cells, um, um, extensiometer, settle point, uh, and all of this, which I don't want to go into detail. There are also units like the GPS uh, that can be used, um, and we have data loggers that kind of centralize the data collection and provide us that information. But now when it comes to um, the traditional approach. The question that is often asked is, is the traditional approach sufficient? 
especially if we want to do a continuous performance monitoring, is the traditional approach sufficient? And often, um, like in terms of to characterize site condition or monitor construction activities, the traditional approach, the main limitation of the traditional approach is that it is a point measurement. We can only get at a few locations where we have the instrumentation. And these instrumentation are not cheap. They are quite expensive. So we don't have the luxury in many projects to have multiple or many um, um, well-distributed, spatially well-distributed monitoring um, that we can achieve uh, because of the cost limitation and also the maintenance requirement and the all of those that come with instrumentation, those who work with field instrumentation know, often uh, things break, we need to fix it, we need to... So there is a lot of challenge when it comes to the traditional approach. So that is where I would like to actually introduce to you and present to you a new approach or a new paradigm where we can use the remote sensing tools and look at this and see whether we can do a better job using remote sensing. And what do I mean by remote sensing here? Um, I will be actually um, touching um, on three uh, topics uh, on remote sensing. One is INSAR, which stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. So it's basically a radar wavelength that we are using. Um, some of you might have heard of LIDAR, LIDAR data. Um, I won't be having any examples of LIDAR in this, but LIDAR is another approach that can be used. Um, photogrammetry is basically utilizing our cameras to do some of the um, displacement measures. So I will actually show you some examples of photogrammetry. And then I'll also show you how thermal remote sensing or so what I mean by remote sensing is using the electromagnetic waves to be able to sense an object from a distance without direct contact. And this, the, the, the sensor can be placed on different platforms. And it could be from a satellite, it could be from an aerial platform, and that aerial platform can be a manned or an unmanned aerial platform or a terrestrial platform where you're standing at a distance from the object that you're trying to sense. Or it could be from a mobile platform where the, it is mounted on some kind of a truck and the truck is passing by and you're capturing the object that of interest. So those are the different uh, remote sensing techniques that I want to uh, kind of uh, show to you, uh, give you an overview and uh, quickly present some case studies um, utilizing that. Now, before I get into a lot of that, I want to give you some basics of INSAR because I will be actually spending a lot of uh, my time today um, discussing INSAR, um, or case studies on INSAR. So I want to actually, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, INSAR, I want to give you a little overview here. So INSAR is, as I said, interferometric synthetic aperture radar. So a synthetic aperture radar works by illuminating the earth with a beam of coherent microwave radiation similar to a laser. So Instead of a laser, we use a microwave radiation in the case of INSAR. And the wavelength of the INSAR bands can be, um, can vary. Um, uh, typical wavelengths that we use are X band, which is about three centimeter, C band, which is about six centimeter, and L band, which is about 24 centimeter. Now, the wavelength of the, uh, the radar 
is very important when it comes to geotechnical performance monitoring. And uh, this is one uh, lesson that I want to learn uh, from what I'm presenting for the INSAR, that anytime you want to monitor anything the, using INSAR, the maximum displacement or maximum settlement that you can uh, measure is half the wavelength. So there is a maximum limit in terms of INSAR. Uh, often when we do instrumentation, uh, we have a lot more flexibility in terms of the maximum. We are often constrained by the minimum displacements it can be measured. But when it comes to uh, INSAR, we can actually get millimeter scale accuracy in terms of minimum displacement, but for the maximum, you can only do up to half the wavelength. So um, between two measurements of in, uh, the radar data, if the object that you are interested has moved more than half the wavelength, you will not be able to precisely measure how much movement has happened, but you will be able to see that there is some decorrelation uh, which could be indicative of uh, some kind of motion. So I will actually um, show you some examples on that. And that's something uh, of that uh, very uh, interest. So here, let me, um, let me play this animation one more time so you can actually see. So here in this animation, you would see that when a satellite comes by and we do image a location using the microwave radiation. And the first time we have a range that we ca calculated and that would be R1. And by the time the satellite came the second time, the ground experienced some kind of settlement or some kind of movement so the range is changed now. So the change in range is the Delta R and the range, first range was R1 and the second range was R2. And what we are trying to find out from our microwave uh, remote sensing is what is that change in uh, range. Now, here is the uh, math behind it. It's, it has a quite an elegant math uh, um, behind this approach. And you can see it's the change in range is um, the wavelength divided by the four pi uh, to change in phase angle. So the change in phase um, is what um, is controlling the change in range. So even if the range is typically about 800 kilometer, because these are from satellite measurements and these satellites are about 800 kilometer away from the ground, but still the change in range is measured by the change in phase. And since the wavelengths are in centimeter scale, the change in range can be measured with millimeter to centimeter accuracy. So that is the benefit of um, utilizing INSAR, you can actually make very, very accurate measurements, even though you are measuring it from about 800 um, kilometers away. Now, let me actually show you some uh, examples um, to see, so that you can see how this approach can be used. So I'll be presenting a few case studies here. Uh, the first case study that I want to show you is from Palos Verdes Peninsula in California. So here, let me actually give you some scale uh, for your reference. You can see here, uh, the scale is given, it is about two kilometers. So this is about roughly a, a five kilometer by 10 kilometer area. So that's about 50 square kilometer that we are monitoring. So quite a large area that we are monitoring. And now what does these uh, colors represent? What does these points represent? Um, so here, 
Precisely, we have 6,5055 PS points. What does a PS point mean? PS point is a persistent scatter point, or it is a point that is persistently giving a back scatter to the satellite. So we have six, uh, six lakhs of them. And if you um, think in terms of the traditional geotechnical monitoring, you can imagine that these are, all, these are like a, a inclinometer or a tilt meter where you are able to measure the ground movement at each of these location. So now using satellite data, we are able to get the benefit of having six lakh inclinometers or in ground instrumentation by just using the satellite data. So that's the incredible power that we have in utilizing remote sensing. Um, if we had to actually uh, place uh, six lakh uh, ground instrumentation, uh, it's it's impossible. You cannot do that. It's, uh, it's going to be ridiculously costly and it's going to take uh, ground space and all of that. So it's not possible. So, but with remote sensing, we can actually capture this kind of uh, data. Now, let me explain the legend and the colors that we see here. Uh, you can see that um, towards red, it is negative values towards green, it is positive values. And uh, it is uh, towards uh, light green to yellow is close to zero. So that's the, the legend. Now, positive values, positive velocities is representing upward motion and negative velocity is representing downward motion. So any uplift that is occurring at the site are shown as positive and any settlement or any downward slope motions that are occurring are represented as negative velocities. Now from INSAR, we can actually do a displacement measurement um, and also we can actually get velocity because we can do this over time with multiple satellite data sets. And we can see how much uh, movement is happening over time. And from that, you can actually derive velocity or acceleration and all of that information. So I hope uh, it is clear to you what you're seeing. You have about six uh, lakh points here. Um, each point, we can actually get a displacement, a velocity, acceleration, all of that information. Um, uh, just for your reference, the Los Angeles uh, Harbor is right here. So we are close to the LA Harbor area. Um, and you can see here, there is a large area showing red. And what this indicates is that there is some kind of ground settlement occurring in this large area. And you can see quite consistent uh, signal. And we did some studies on what is happening in this area. And what we found was it is because of the groundwater pumping, uh, there is large settlement happening in this community. So you can clearly see the groundwater pumping and settlements that are happening in this area. In other areas, you can see that there is some uplift happening. Um, and uh, we need to actually look carefully into this, uh, what is causing that. Um, some, uh, and some of the areas you can see they are mostly yellow. Uh, they don't have any, any major um, movements. Now, there are some areas where there is no PS points obtained. For example, here you can see there is no PS points. Uh, there are parts of the area here you don't have PS points. Now, why is that? Now, not having PS points could be 
from different reasons. Uh, in a previous slide, I told you that if the displacement uh, between two satellite acquisitions is more than the half the wavelength, we will not get a point. We will not be able to detect it. So these locations may be having large movements. That is one possibility, but you cannot actually infer that without more investigation. Or there could be rapid movements happening due to vegetation and other things. So not having points is indicative of something happening or possibly just noise from vegetation. So that needs to be verified further. So we actually did some more investigation, which I'll actually show you um, in my next slide. So here, uh, this was the, the landslide inventory for California that was developed by USGS, uh, which is the United States Geologic Survey. Um, and this is uh, from the 1950s to the present. And they had actually categorized uh, this area into uh, some landslides. And you can see two, into two categories, dormant landslides and active landslides. So the yellow represents the dormant areas and the red represents the active areas. And if you actually uh, remember that last slide, you would see that some of the areas where we don't have points is from here and the other is from here. So some of these could be because these dormant landslides have reactivated or it could be because there are some vegetation also here. So we are not quite sure. But based on our initial survey, we, ca we uh, updated this landslide inventory and I'll actually show you here. So we are utilizing the, the previous landslide inventory that the California Geological Survey developed and our work and we updated and we actually mapped 263 landslides. And 68 of them are relatively stable slopes, um, which is this RSS category. Dormant landslide with average velocity of movement less than four millimeter per year. The second class that we developed was hundred and uh, of uh, PAS, which is potentially active slide, 114 of them. And they have this yellow color and they are active landslides, but no PS available. We didn't have PS and they didn't have a lot of vegetation. So we are inferring that these are active landslides. That is why we didn't get um, the backscatter points. Then there are about 14 that we categorize as long-term slides uh, mapped in green. They are active landslides with average velocity greater than four millimeter per year. And then there is 67 that we identified as unmapped, extremely slow landslides. Um, they were not previously mapped. They are new ones uh, from the California Geological Survey's inventory. And uh, they were not previously mapped, but they have average velocity greater than four, four millimeters. So here you can see the use of this INSAR technology combined with the traditional landslide inventory where you can actually update the landslide inventory to identify new landslides or active slides happening in this area. Now, let's take a minute and think, how can this be used for geotechnical performance monitoring? Be it for a new site that you want to plan in this area, now you have an idea of the sites or locations where there is ground movements happening. So you, if, you, if your site or if your project that you're planning is going to be close to that location, you can take um, necessary measures or even avoid building in those sites. So it, for in terms of doing um, uh, the, in terms of geotechnical performance monitoring, 
even for site characterization, you can actually use the remote sensing data. You can use the remote sensing data for uh, any, uh, any um, uh, forensic investigation. If you want to actually look at an event that happened here in the past, and if you want to do that, you can do that. Uh, or if you have already an infrastructure here and you wanted to monitor, that can be done. Um, you can use that, uh, the remote sensing technology. So there is a lot of possibility. And uh, as I show you some more examples, I think that would be clear to you. Uh, I, I want to actually point out to you that right here, we can see a large area that we see as potentially um, unmapped, extremely slow landslide. It's actually a golf course owned by the US president, Donald Trump. So this is a golf course that we found is having a lot of problem and there are some slow moving landslides uh, within that golf course. Let me show you another example of an infrastructure that we monitored from this area. Um, very close to that previous um, uh, satellite scene that we uh, evaluated. This is a dam um, called the Casitas Dam uh, in Northwest of Los Angeles, located in the Ventura County, about 100 miles Northwest of LA. And this dam was um, authorized by the US Congress in 1955 and the construction happened in nine, um, from 56 to 1959, and it, it is built on Lake Casitas, which is uh, a 2 lakh 54,000 acre um, feet uh, in, um, in dimension. And the specification of the dam uh, is given here for those of you who are in working in the dams area. Uh, you can see the specification. Uh, the crest length is about 2,000 feet. Um, the crest elevation is about 300 and 585 feet. Uh, the spillway elevation, which is right here, uh, is about 567 feet. The structural height, which is from here, you can see it's about 335 uh, feet. And the berm height, which is a berm that is being constructed here, and I will actually explain to you why that berm was constructed is about 130 feet. And as I pointed, uh, 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 as you can see here, this berm was constructed in 1999 to 2000. So the dam was constructed in, uh, construction was completed in 1959 and the berm was constructed in uh, 2000. So significantly after the dam was constructed. So it is a uh, addition to the dam. And I'll explain to you why that was done. So here are some um, newspaper articles from the Los Angeles Times uh, from 1998. You can see that uh, in 1998, this, uh, there were studies done and that they found that the dam is not safe uh, in terms of uh, earthquake stability. Um, if there was any earthquake in the region that the dam would liquefy um, and a major, um, portion of it would fail, uh, which could lead to 400 people dying uh, downstream of the uh, dam. So because of that uh, concern, uh, the US Congress um, in 1998 approved a berm to be constructed to stabilize the dam. And it was approved for a 20 million. So that they have that information here. Um, and when they construct, uh, yes, it is here. You can see the 20 million project to reinforce the structure. And when it was constructed, it cost 42 million. So you can see, although the, it was estimated to be 20 million, the cost was significantly higher, uh, almost 100% over the estimate and it cost 42 million to retrofit the dam. Now, let's actually see how the dam is doing um, using INSAR. We were interested to see how the dam is doing after this retrofit. 
And for that, we used um, the uh, data from a, a, um, the ASAR NVSAT, which is from the European Space Agency. This is a satellite that they had from 2002 to 2012. And um, we utilized the data from 2005 to 2010, a five-year window. And uh, the spatial resolution of this data is 20 meters. Uh, wavelength is 5.6 centimeters. So again, uh, um, wave, if the wavelength is 5.6 centimeter, between two data scenes, I can measure up to 2.8 centimeter movement. Anything more than that, I will not be able to measure. So that's something to keep in mind. So we utilized this data and evaluated the dam site. What did we find in our evaluation? So here you can see the dam. Here are the points. Um, you can see that the color varies from red to blue here. Um, blue, red is negative, uh, blue is positive. Again, positive is uplift, negative is downward movement. And you can see that there are some areas that are showing some downward movement, some areas that are showing upward motion. We plotted a time series of these displacements, which at four locations. So you can see one, two, three, and four. And let me show you the time series of that. So here on the x-axis, we have the time from 2005 to 2010. And on the y-axis, we have the displacement in millimeters. And you can see that at points one, uh, the, this color represents four. So the first one is four, the blue, which is one, and gray, which is three. So four has the minimum movement. It is pretty stable, um, almost uh, within the margin of error. Um, points three and one are showing some movement, but not that much. But point two is certainly showing much higher movement. Uh, you can see that in that five-year period, it has moved about 45 millimeters compared to the other points uh, where three and one only moved about 15 millimeters and point four only moved less than five millimeters. So um, this is an interesting observation where you can actually get a continuous uh, reading across the dam. Now, again, you can see here there is multiple points if you had to instrument this dam with all these inclinometers and um, tilt meters and things like that, it would have cost a fortune for monitoring and maintaining that instrumentation. But here you can do this with freely available satellite data, you can actually get this information. So that's the beauty of utilizing uh, remote sensing here. Now, what is happening here? I will dig deeper into this uh, case study a little more. Um, let me actually show you a time series that we developed for this. Um, so what we did was we did an interpolation using Krigging to see how that movements are happening. So this is the start time period, uh, 2005, um, uh, uh, we started. And these areas are the areas where the displacements are happening. Um, you can actually see as you progress in time, uh, now it is 2006, as you progress in time, you can see where those displacements are. And you can clearly see that the berm that was constructed is also showing signs of displacement. So there is some kind of trend here that is moving this way. As you progress, now it is 2008. You can see that that movement is becoming more prominent here and here. And you can see by 2009, it has become much more prominent here. It's continuously moving. And this is the final. So you can actually see 
At maximum here, we saw that there was about 22 millimeters. Uh, maximum displacement here was about 32 millimeters. So there is some movement happening here and there is some uplift happening here uh, outside the dam area. Now, we took a closer look at this location and you can see that there are visible signs of damage from that movement. There is, um, there is ground cracks visible and failure of material happening right at that location where that movement is happening. So not only we can detect it from um, radar, but there is from radar, we can quantify it, but from um, visible satellite images, we can also see the damages that are happening at the site. So that's another way to verify what we see from the uh, radar. Uh, and the berm uh, where this maximum displacement was happening, there was no visible sign. So that was interesting. We didn't see any visible sign, but there is from the radar, we are seeing that there is significant movement happening at that location. Now, how does this help us in terms of uh, monitoring dams? Now, um, you can see this is the guideline for monitoring dams uh, in US uh, by the, uh, the hydropower uh, projects uh, or by the Federal Energy Regulation Commission. And uh, they recommend for dam uh, or embankments that surface settlement, surface alignment and foundation movement has to be measured. And for existing dam uh, embankments, um, settlement of the crust or bulging of the slope might indicate developing problems. So, and this need to be monitored. Uh, monitored visual observation or by a uh, trained inspector. Um, then for embankments, horizontal and vertical surface movement um, should be monitored. Uh, measuring po points should be spaced sufficiently close to allow measurement of all significant deformation and five to 10 measuring points are typically sufficient. So now you can see that from the INSAR, you can actually get more than what the Federal Energy Regulation Commission recommends. You can get uh, not just five or 10 points, you can get significantly higher number of points and be able to uh, understand whether there is quantitatively understand how much movement is happening uh, rather than just doing visual observation. So there is a lot of power in the INSAR approach for monitoring critical infrastructure like dams. Let me quickly show you another example here. This is an example from um, a case study in um, uh, Nevada um, where we are mo monitoring a slope along a transportation corridor. Um, here you can see that the, uh, this is a rail corridor here, a very important rail corridor, um, which um, takes uh, all the goods from the Midwest to the West and uh, any disruption to this line can have uh, serious uh, economic consequences. So uh, keeping this line safe is critical. So, uh, but there are several landslides forming along this line and the company contacted us to see if we would look at it and see what is the problem at these sites. Um, and what ha happened was that from 2005, they had seen slope movements happening here. And in 2006, six, some uh, rotational slope uh, motions were observed and in 2011, a massive rock slide began forming. And from then the railway company started doing ground monitoring using some LIDAR and other techniques. Um, and they asked us if we could take a look at this site with satellite remote sensing. In this case, we used uh, a, two different satellites. We used one called the ERS, uh, uh, and the other one called NVSAT. The ERS was available from 1992 to 2000, and the NVSAT was available from 2003 to 2010. So you can see here, this is the ERS data. We have a gap here between 2000 and 2003, and then from 2003, we had the NVSAT data. 
for this approach, we uh, stacked all the images from the ERS and uh, NVSAT. And we analyze that. And you can see here, um, this is the location where we had uh, the slope failures are happening. This is the railway line. And these are the INSAR points that we got. Now, let's actually look at the, uh, the satellite data. So all the way from 1992, you can see that the satellite data is there. There is no movement. The, uh, the entire ERS stack, the site was stable. From 2003, uh, the site is stable still, but in 2005 onwards, you can see that there is some movements happening at the site. And in 2010, the site failed. So why all of a sudden, a site that was stable for decades started moving in 2005? Um, so, that's what we, we, that intrigued us and we wanted to look into this further. And we looked in the literature to see what happened in this area. Was there an earthquake? Were there any natural hazards that occurred? And what we found was a stamped photograph with date, you can see here, January 12th, 2005, that there was a major flooding event in this area. And rail cars were um, toppled, uh, railway line was completely destroyed, and they had to actually put to back the railway line. And during that process of putting back the railway line, what they did was they actually blasted the toe of some of these slopes to get the material to create the sublayer and the ballast for the new track. And by, by blasting the toe of the slope, they created some problem by uh, making some of those slopes unstable. So this was an issue where their own action caused this problem to occur. So you can see here a very good example of uh, how you can use INSAR for a forensic investigation. Um, where you can actually find out why, what was causing this problem? Why is this problem now all of a sudden propped up? Uh, you can do that with INSAR. Now, not only just forensic investigation, we can actually go further and do a more proactive performance monitoring. And what we did was for that entire long stretch of corridor where they had, we did persistent scatter um, interferometry using um, SAR data. And we found other sites where they would have potentially a problem, where we found that there is unstable slopes with large displacements happening. And we identified those and we let them know that you need to actually fix some of these locations. And I'll actually show you, based on our recommendation, they went back and fixed some of those sites. And here, one more point that I want to show here is, you can see this area being a much more unstable than this route. So even for planning future routes, if you want to do um, where you want to build the next railroad or say, if the railroad company wanted to do some expansion, they can do INSAR and figure out, okay, whether this area is safe or whether this area is safe. Those kind of studies can also be done with the INSAR. So here is uh, some of the areas that we identified as unstable from the uh, INSAR. Um, this is the site we looked at. Um, this, uh, this is a site that was quite stable. So you can see here, this is from a stable site. Um, this is another stable site for your reference. Um, this is a site where we pointed out that there was uh, unstable slopes and they fixed it with short creating. And so that, those are some examples from the Nevada. Now, um, let me actually quickly show you some of the available sensors um, that you can use. Um, there are several uh, past sensors that you can utilize for um, radar studies. Um, uh, I showed you examples of ERS and NVSAT. 
uh, there are some th there are other ones also again this is not an exhaustive list this is just an example uh, there are several current satellites that are available particularly the sentinel uh, alos is one that we showed for the california uh, but sentinel is a data set that is available for free from european space agency excellent satellite uh, data available um, there are also future missions planned several future missions including the nisar mission um, in fact this nisar mission is a joint program between the nasa and the indian space research organization um, they are going to launch um, the radar satellite in 2022 uh, will have full global coverage uh, with every cycle and um, i'm i'm uh, sure that this data will be available for free uh, especially for researchers in US and India. There are already calls that are coming out from both NASA and ISRO to do research with this data set uh, in areas related to geotechnical engineering and civil engineering, uh, infrastructure monitoring. So you might want to keep an eye on that if you are interested to work in this, but this is going to be an L-band SAR mission and it's going to be an exciting time for uh, utilizing this data for uh, infrastructure monitoring and hazard monitoring and things like that. Let me quickly actually go through some other examples um, uh, for um, of use, uh, moving away from SAR or synthetic aperture radar. Let me show you some examples using photogrammetry. Uh, I don't know if any of you are using these techniques. This is becoming quite popular these days. Uh, you can use a um, regular DSLR camera. In this case, we use a Nikon D800 camera. Uh, we placed it on a drone um, and uh, we took a um, data set. This is the exact same location where that um, INSAR data we collected along the rail line uh, where the failure was happening. We wanted to create a very high resolution digital elevation model for that area uh, to do some analysis. And we did this with uh, a, a DSLR camera. And here I want to show you a comparison between the LIDAR data, uh, which the instrument cost uh, about $20,000, $30,000, to uh, op photogrammetry data, which only cost about uh, two dollars $3,000. And you can see the comparison. We had very good uh, results from the uh, photogrammetry and the LIDAR. So the video that you're seeing, the larger area is from the LIDAR. And this short area, uh, if you're able to see this, my uh, cursor, the short area is from the photogrammetry. Uh, you can actually see the rail infrastructure very clearly. You can actually measure uh, any of those infrastructure. Um, you can make measurements on the rock. Um, you will see some of the failure planes that are forming um, right now. I'll turn off the LIDAR and just show you the photogrammetry. Uh, in a second. So what you are seeing right now is only the photogrammetry data. So using a, a DSLR camera, you can actually mark the failure plane that is forming there. So that's the SCARP, the failure SCARP. So this is the kind of data set that you can develop with the, uh, with the photogrammetry. With the, in the interest of time, let me actually move forward. Um, there is another example that we want to I want to show you here. Again, we are using photogrammetry to monitor a landslide that is forming near a bridge. Um, this is a very critical bridge. This has the pipeline from the Alaska, um, north, north slope of Alaska, where all the oil is being produced and the oil is being pumped through this pipeline. So any damage to this bridge is uh, critical. Um, so we, the, the company asked us if we could monitor this uh, slope and whether this slope is progressing. So we did um, a, um, a photogrammetric analysis. We developed a 3D model of the site. Uh, every point you can actually measurement the, measure the displacement. Uh, this is a 3D model, it's not a photograph. Um, so you can actually, uh, it's a point cloud, you can actually measure the displacement at every point. 
We did this at two time periods. We did it in 2015 and um, 2016. Um, and you can see, oh, sorry, 2014 and 2015. So this is a point cloud from 2014. Uh, the next one is from 2015. Um, you can see in 2015, they were doing, doing some drilling here, which is not there in 2014. Um, and we did a change detection between the 2014 and 2015. You can see here, uh, what we found was that there is only erosional um, uh, features that are happening. There is no large movement at this site between the two time periods, mostly um, material uh, eroding from uh, some of the deposited area and getting accumulated in the toe of the slope that is always happening. So we informed the company that that the site doesn't seem to have the, the or the landslide is not progressing. Whatever failures that are happening at the site seems to be more um, contained within that first landslide that happened. So that's the, uh, the kind of work. There is another work that we did um, in um, the along a pipeline corridor. You can actually monitor the stability of a pipeline. This is the same pipeline that I showed earlier. Um, uh, the pipeline that carries oil from North Slope of Alaska, uh, very difficult terrain. Um, those of you have heard, of, uh, learned about Alaska, you know we have a lot of permafrost there. And these pipelines are placed on thermosiphons that keep the pipeline stable, um, and even when, and they keep the temperature of the permafrost constant so that it doesn't thaw and freeze. Uh, so, but there are situations where some areas do fail. So monitoring the stability of this pipeline is critical. And again, we used uh, the photogrammetry approach uh, to fly a drone and uh, capture the data and measure how the pipeline is performing over time. You can actually measure every single point on the pipeline and see over time whether the pipeline is remaining stable or not. We had identified some areas where there is potential slope failures happening. Um, again, with the interest of time, I'm going to go through it pretty fast, um, but I'll be happy to share some of this information if you are interested to work on these topics. Here, this one actually shows the failure that is forming. Um, this is over time. You, can, you would see the displacement vectors when we place, you would see that there is a rotational failure, this side failing, and there is uplift happening at the toe of the slope. So the, here, the displacement vectors are going up, and here you can see the displacement vectors are going down. So the pipeline is failing in a rotational manner. Um, here, the slopes are slumping. Here, there is uplift happening at the toe. So that's the kind of data that you can actually get from photogrammetry. Now, let me actually show you one last example here. In this case, we are doing a thermal remote sensing uh, to monitor the condition of the concrete, uh, particularly in a bridge site uh, for identifying delamination. Um, if uh, those of you are familiar with uh, concrete bridges, uh, you probably know that when the concrete layer detaches from the reinforcement, that is when a delamination is formed. So there is a pocket formed below the concrete layer between the reinforcement and the concrete where there is air void. And that is a dangerous situation because in that pocket, um, you could have corrosion happening and you wouldn't know uh, that there is delamination and there is corrosion. And finally, the bridge could collapse because of the uh, reinforcement being compromised. So uh, identifying the delamination ahead is important. And uh, we used uh, thermal remote sensing in this case. And uh, again, from a drone platform, we measured uh, the, uh, uh, we identified these areas that have a different thermal signature and we found was that the delaminations show a warmer temperature because of that air void, the, the, the transfer of heat through the material is different compared to other areas where there is continuous concrete. 
So where there is continuous concrete, the dissipation of heat occurs much more smoothly. Whereas when there is that air void, the dissipation of heat is different. And you can see that there is um, warmer spots identified. And we validated this with um, a sounding technique that is, to, uh, that is used um, traditionally. And we had pretty good um, um, confirmation that these are the results from the sounding that is shown in purple. And uh, these are shown in red are the areas where you can see that the thermal um, uh, remote sensing identified. So you can actually use some of this thermal remote sensing in terms of uh, monitoring the, the retaining walls uh, where there is reinforcement um, being uh, corroded for bridges, for uh, dams, for structures, you can actually utilize thermal remote sensing to understand behavior below the surface. Whereas most of the other remote sensing is using surficial measurements, the thermal remote sensing helps you to go below the surface. There are other methods also that can go below the surface like ground penetrating radar and things like that. So uh, thermal remote sensing is not the only one, but thermal remote sensing can be one of the um, options too. Um, so let me conclude with uh, some summary. Um, it, I know I have gone through a lot of material, um, um, but I hope you have uh, seen at least some of the uh, use of uh, remote sensing. Um, I think there is a lot of potential in this approach for, to uh, turn the way we do performance monitoring and condition monitoring in geotechnical engineering um, and structural engineering and so on. Um, the INSAR provides rich data archive for forensic investigation. Uh, you can get millimeter scale movements uh, from satellite platform using stacking techniques. Uh, it provides opportunity to proactively monitor infrastructure, um, uh, provide improved spatial and temporal resolution right now. Um, the temporal resolution is about, um, uh, it's about uh, seven days you can get, seven to 15 days, but there is a uh, new venture that is started in US, um, a private company setting, sending SAR satellites. And they are hoping in about four years that every four hours, they will be able to monitor any infrastructure on earth. So there is uh, exciting developments happening in the world of INSAR remote sensing. The photogrammetry user has more control on the temporal resolution. You can go out and collect data at any time, very cost effective. Uh, you can get centimeter scale accuracy. It's not as um, good as the INSAR, but pretty good for um, most of our application. Uh, symbol processing makes it a more attractive approach. It's more uh, e uh, easier than a INSAR processing. So photogrammetry is attractive in that way. And in thermal, there is a lot of potential for monitoring integrity of concrete structures, moisture, seepage, and all of those issues. So these are some conclusions. Um, let me acknowledge my uh, funding agencies and uh, uh, collaborators and students uh, and postdocs who have done all the hard work uh, for me and uh, without the contribution from the funding agencies uh, will not have been able to achieve all of those work that we did. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And as uh, Professor Rajiv Kumar mentioned, um, he has put my contact information in the chat box. So if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. And I hope uh, this was informative and uh, hope to answer your questions and thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Thomas Oman. Uh, there are some questions from uh, participants. Absolutely, please. Which software was used to create point cloud data? Is it Pix4D? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, we use uh, both uh, Pix4D and uh, the Agisoft uh, PhotoScan. Both softwares have been used. Um, we have done even a paper comparing them, um, and we have found that they both
provide very good uh, or equally good results. Uh, so if you are interested in that paper, I'd be happy to send that to you. I think that's the only question from yes, the participants. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Thomas Human. Uh, it was very much interesting to see that uh, remote sensing has a vital role in the uh, geotechnical performance monitoring. Uh, we are enlightened with the talk. Uh, uh, the current uh, research advances in the international arena uh, we could see in the global level what are the developments happening. Uh, we are you know, on behalf of the participants and uh, uh, Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology and faculty members from uh, civil engineering department and everyone around uh, worked for this faculty development program. I say a heart, uh, from the core of my heart, uh, a big thank you to you. Uh, we will definitely uh, will have uh, uh, a personal uh, appearance here. Uh, we will make some arrangements here whenever you come, come to India after this COVID scare. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks for having me and I enjoyed it and I hope we will have more interactions in the future. Mm. Thank you, sir. The participants can uh, see the website link which I have posted here uh, about Professor Thomas Mann's official details. You can see his publications and uh, the research interest and other details there. Some of you may be interested in that. Now participants may fill out the attendance sheet and uh, feedback also. Uh, professor, uh, that's all from this session. Okay, okay. thank you. And we will uh, be in touch with you. Uh, very nice to have you in this session and uh, I felt very happy to see you here. And I will convey this matter to uh, Professor Vinod also. Uh, there is a YouTube live session going on here. So I'm sure there are other participants who will be watching this in the YouTube itself. Okay. Sounds good. So I'll actually then stop sharing. Yeah, of course. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Mm. Take care. Bye. Mm. Bye. And thank you all of the participants on behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, Rajagiri School of Engineering and Technology. So uh, we have kept the zoom meeting uh, there for another 10 minutes so that you can uh, fill out the form for attendance of session three so uh, all of you who are not yet filled the form can fill out the attendance and if any one of you missed filling the attendance you can contact the organizing committee in the email id provided in the brochure so thank you once again good night and stay safe